Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that little uh, <coughs> intro to this video. But yes, if, in case you still haven't figured out what this is, this is a uh, this is my submission for the uh, Reddit challenge this this week. Sorry, uh, my voice has been really really hurting this week. Actually, I can't. I'm I'm not, I'm I'm, un I'm unable to articulate as much as I would normally do. So I hope that's all right. But um, yes, this week's video Reddit challenge um, feels like it was made almost made for me because. <laughs> It's about uh, reusable missions and SSTOs and all that good stuff. So the actual criteria was, I th well, I thought I'd put my own little twist in it. I mean, yes, I could have easily got super mode by just submitting any number of my other SSTO videos. But I thought, you know, I'd, it seems like a bit of a cop out, really. I thought I'd make a dedicated mission for it. So I was having a look at the mission criteria and it was normal mode is send a fully reusable craft to the Mun. And super mode would be send a fully reusable craft to Juno and back again. Now, I feel like um, no, I've said that wrong, haven't I? Normal mode is send a reusable mission to Mun, and hard mode is send a reusable mission to Juna, and as per usual, super mode is just the ambiguousness of impress me. So I feel like, me personally, an SSTO to Juna and back is enough to warrant super mode. I feel like that's quite a difficult thing to ask. Um, Although the mission, the um, the actual challenge doesn't actually specify that it needs to be an SSTO, so I guess doing an SSTO to Juno, I feel like that should get super mode if I'm able to opine on how the challenge ought to be run. But I thought I'd take it one step further and kind of look at the criteria for normal mode and hard mode and see if there's any kind of way of amalgamating the two. So in this case, I thought, well, you know, normal mode is Ju is Mun, and hard mode is um, Juno, so why not super mode be both? That was a that was real English, wasn't it? So this is just going to Mun and Juna in one mission, which uh, takes an enormous amount of Delta V. So I hope you enjoy the mission. <laughs> it literally just popped in my head like, oh, this would be kind of a cool twist on the idea. Like I said, I kind of wanted it to keep it, like, I, I guess like a, a more appropriate super mode would be something like Moho or Eve. But I'm like, ah, uh, it'd be kind of cool to kind of pay tribute to the actual cri You know, I feel like, do you guys understand what I'm talking about here? Like just sort of some sort of twist on what the actual challenge was. So that was... That was the logic behind this. So, the craft. This is the uh, this is the voodoo. There it is appearing on the map screen now, quite appropriately. Uh, by the way, I feel like this is now a really poor time to mention this, but there is a music video version of this video in the description if you guys want to see that. Just thought I'd just thought I'd put that out there before we get too far into this video. We are only three minutes in, so we're not. I feel like we're not too late. Anyway, this is the voodoo, and it is fairly similar to the Icarus craft, which is. Uh, an SS2 I built. It actually had slightly more range than the Voodoo, although I feel that, well, I mean, the Voodoo has less Delta V in LKO, but I feel like that was probably just my ascent wasn't as efficient as it was with the Icarus space plane. So the Icarus space plane was a SS2 I sent to. It was a similar mission to this in that we landed on two celestial bodies. In that mission, we landed on Elu and we landed on Lath. So that mission was obviously a lot harder than this one, but so I feel like that would have been a better submission for Super Mode. But like I say, this one is kind of a nice little trip. Tip of my hat. A tip of the fedora. Quite appropriately given that it's a red challenge to the challenge itself. Anyway, I've said this enough now. I don't need to keep reiterating the logic behind choosing this particular mission profile. Um, but yeah, some of you may notice it bears quite a lot of similarities to the Icarus in that it's basically designed for maximum efficiency. So we have really lightweight uh, circular intakes there. There's a little bit of part clipping to get those gold tanks kind of forming an internal rim to the intakes, but that's mainly for aesthetic purposes. I mean, they're not you're clipping them into the tanks like that is not doing a great deal. And there's only two clipped into the air intake. So if you're a purist and don't like any part clipping whatsoever, you can feel free to take those shot, those um, air intakes off and just put them on quote unquote normally. And then this craft would work exactly the same. But I, I only did put the gold tanks there too, because it, I quite like the way it makes the in intakes look a little bit more unique, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, now we get to the hardest part of this mission. Uh, second only perhaps to taking off from Juno again is uh, the landing on Juno itself. Now you can see our surface velocity is still very very high. Really this thing going any faster than 100 meters per second is going to destroy it. So we have to basically try and bleed up as much speed as possible by coasting through the atmosphere. What I'm looking at mainly is on the top right of the screen you can see our vertical speed and horizontal speed. And we want our vertical speed to be as absolutely low as possible because it's going to be the vertical speed that will kill us if we smash into the surface too fast. Horizontal speed it obviously needs to be low, but we can bleed off like most of the horizontal speed using the friction from the wheels, but those aren't very effective against vertical speed. So we're still, as you can see, we're still coasting along in the air and we've still got a little way to go before I'm feeling like I, before I felt like I was going slow enough to be comfortable 
in uh, hitting the ground. And there we go, we're kind of using the downward slope of this hill here because when we deploy those drogue shoots there, whilst it's going to slow us down lots before we touch down, it's going to end up pointing our nose down towards the ground a little bit. So I tried to time it when I was passing over a little bump. So when I landed on the ground, the ground would be sloping the same direction the aircraft was pointing. This took a lot of attempts. It took a lot of attempts to get that landing nailed. But we did it in the end, so just with a little bit of patience and Jack Daniels, you can, uh, you too can uh, achieve that. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just sitting here sipping on water, <laughs> just trying to keep, keep my voice thing. So yeah, I mean, uh, this, this uh, people that follow me on Discord or Twitter, well, no, this would have just this was just announced on Discord, and I guess the one guy on Reddit who I've been liaising with. Uh, there was meant to be a Blunderbirds episode this week. This has been delayed because a lot of people asked me to. Um, do more reddit challenge videos people are asking like on the subreddit you know why don't why don't you do subreddit challenges anymore and the reason is well a they've been redoing all their missions recently or redoing all the challenges for a while now and i when i that's how i started my channel for those who don't know i kind of started this channel based on me just doing reddit challenges so i owe it to reddit my entire existence on this platform so i think credit to reddit there but uh, yeah like none of the challenges are really either, either they've not really caught my eye or I felt they've not really lent themselves well to kind of a video format that would have been quite boring like for example driving a robe to the top of a mountain whilst obviously it's an impressive challenge and it's a good thing to show off your you know your elite skills with a Z I feel like it'd be quite a boring video to watch so it's just things like that but this an SSTO to Juna and for my, for my version would be SSTO to Juna and none that does lend itself quite well to a video, I hope. I mean, you guys might hate this, but I hope it's I hope it's tolerable. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Ascending from Juno, I tend to aim for about 30 degrees uh, away from the surface. I feel like that tends to be the sweet spot in terms of gaining altitude fast enough to get through the thicker parts of the atmosphere without wasting too much fuel, while not pointing upward too much to end up wasting fuel kind of when you're pointing too sharply upwards you end up kind of creating a lot of drag and therefore wasting a lot of fuel so it's quite hard to find the sweet spot for ascending from Juno there are probably better players than me out there who know the exact kind of angle of attack you need to get the most efficient takeoff but 30 degrees seems to work for me so I just went with it and we still have whilst we don't have that much fuel left in terms of how much we had to start with we have about over 3,000 meters per second of delta V so if we play this right we easily have enough to get to the moon now so I was pretty happy with that uh, I had a backup plan, whereas if I couldn't land on the Mun, I would just land on either Minmus or Ike. Maybe both. <laughs> but yeah, Minmus and Ike. Well, Ike takes about 300, takes about 400 meters per second to land on Ike. So uh, yeah. So my escape goes. If I can't do Mun, I'll just land on Ike, and we'll call it that mission. That was always the plan along. But luckily, at that point, I was like, you know what? I think we have enough for Mun. Obviously, we don't need to. Um, if you try and think of how much Delta V and SSTO needs to get to the Mun from low carbon orbit, do bear in mind that we don't have to waste any fuel getting from low carbon orbit to Mun orbit because we'll just use um, aero braking to get our apoapsis to the right height or near enough. So it took a lot of attempts to get our, our periapsis just right, so we'd end up with an apoapsis to kind of put us on an intersect with the Mun, or at least put us on an orbit that crossed over the Mun's orbit, and then we could just wait a bit for an encounter to appear. But yeah, in the end, obviously this is played on 100% re-entry heating. That's almost become a meme, I think, at this point, me saying that over and over again. But just for full discrepancy, that's it. And uh, yeah, we are now captured around Kerbin, so the first phase of the mission is complete. We've done Juno. We could land at Kerbin now, and this would be qualifying for hard mode. But like I say, I wanted to go a little bit further. So now we're in a stable orbit again with our periapsis raised. We're going to a couple of orbits, and there we go. A Mun encounter has appeared. If that didn't just happen automatically. I probably would have just played around with maneuver nodes, but luckily the way my orbit worked out, I didn't have to do any burning to get that money counter. I just had to wait a, wait a few days, obviously in game, not in real life, and do a fine tune to get our uh, periapsis nice and close to the moon's surface, and then we'll just time warp up and get to our money counter. Not much more, not much more to say about that really, is there? <laughs> and then we have a lovely blue marble in the background there, and then we're going to just, I don't know, just time warp to periapsis, I suppose. Do a quick burn. Uh, even though this is powered by a nuclear engine, because as you can see, there is basically <coughs> any and all weight savings that could be made have been made. Um, there's no batteries on here, there's, no, there's nothing other than the cockpit. For those of you wondering why the electric charge isn't depleting, and why it hasn't really depleted for the whole video, it's because I've got um, infinite electricity turned on. Now that's uh, 
That's not that's not true. In fact, if you eagle-eyed mine, you may already know the answer to this. If you look at the nose cone of this rocket, you can see we have the SAS nose cone there, but we also have that kind of rectangular sort of structure jutting out at the front as well. That's actually an RTG that's clipped in there, which is a thermoelectric generator. That's just constantly generating power for us. And the amount of electricity this craft uses is so minimal anyway. We only need the one RTG with no extra battery capacity on top of the 50 units that the cockpit provides so it's fine and then obviously the nuclear engine provides power whenever it's burning as well so electricity was never an issue here now we did kind of a, 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 a not perfect <laughs> takeoff here we kind of kicked off the edge of this crater i was hoping it would be a nice smooth ramp like transition into into the into the air <laughs> into kind of space i suppose because you know i don't know if you guys know this but there's no air on the moon um, but it, I ended up sort of bouncing up, so I cut the throttle, let, a, let my SAS spin me back around, uh, facing prograde again, and then we could just start burning, and it was fine. Like I say, although, as I, well, as I was saying before I went on a massive tangent, although we've got a nuclear engine craft here, the thrust weight ratio isn't really that bad at all in terms of how long it takes to do burns, because any and all weight savings that could be made were made. So this, this craft is very, very... For a nuclear powered craft, the burn times are very, very, very tolerable, and uh, the thrust weight ratio is pretty good. So look at that, 3.64 for a nuclear engine is, well, <laughs> this being said, we only have 215 units of liquid fuel and everything else is just empty tanks in the cockpit, so I guess this was a bad time to talk about the thrust rate ratio. But yeah, we've already braked from interplanetary space with no explosion, so I guess you guys know that we can easily tolerate an air break from Mun orbit at this point, so got an abra apoapsis down to 180-ish metres, oh, 180,000 metres, I should say, so... It, we could, it would be a bit easier to get to the runway again if we have that a little bit higher, though I am conscious that we only have about 650 meter, 651 meters per second of delta V, which I know is more than enough to get get back to the runway. I think I've got back from lathe orbit with about 700 meters per second of force. It's easily enough, but it just makes it a little bit easier to have as much fuel as possible just when you, in case I overshoot the runway. And at this point, I wasn't quite sure how stable this craft was going to be during flight at Kerbin with empty fuel tanks. I know the Icarus, which as I mentioned earlier, this craft was based on, uh, was horribly, horribly unstable in Kerbin atmosphere with um, with the fuel tanks pretty much empty. So if we have a little bit of fuel left over, not only can we influence the center of mass of the craft by pumping it all into the nose cone, but also it gives us the opportunity to use our rapier engines in air breathing mode to kind of exit our stall. If you just accelerate, you can usually kind of leave, sorry, that was my phone. You can accelerate to leave the stall and recover yourself. So that's kind of, that, that, that's, what, that's why I wanted to have lots of fuel left. And 195 units, while at face value doesn't seem like much, the efficiency of the engines, that can go a long way. So, well yeah, I haven't really talked about the actual ins and outs of what I was doing there, but there we are, burning at apoapsis now. We have a pretty, a nice stable orbit, nice and low as well, 72 and 70 meters, 70,000 meters I should say. So, couldn't ask for much better orbits. So obviously we are at a slant, but so, what we're going to do is just going to time warp, well, what I've done now, it's kind of, bit, it's been and gone. But what I did was I just waited until our orbit passed roughly over the Kerbal Space Center, or at least by the time we'd kind of got to that point in our orbit, we'd be flying roughly over the KSC. And then we did our retrograde burn, and then we'll just use the uh, elevators and elevons on the craft itself, and of course the SAS units to point ourselves towards the Kerbal Kerbal Space Center. So I'm looking for the mountain, and you can see it on the left there. That kind of is a good indication of where the Kerbal Space Center is. And I'm just sort of squinting through the cloud layer, trying to find the little peninsula that it sits on. And I, I didn't realize it was that one there. I thought it was the one, there's like another bit of land sticking out of it further north. I thought it was that one, which is why I overshot a little bit. But luckily, we could recover quite easily. Did a little bit of fuel uh, expenditure to get ourselves close to the runway, but I, I don't even know if it was needed, to be honest. We had plenty of fuel left over regardless, so it didn't matter either way. And there we go, just gradually getting ready to touch down, and there we are. So, uh, yeah, feels good to be back in the driver's seat behind uh, doing a Reddit challenge. It's been a while since I did one. The last one I think I did was the uh, the submarine redux, and that was just because the submarine Reddit challenge was the first video I ever made, and that was obviously here we are today. So, yeah, this is the first one in 2017, I think. And to be honest, I don't want to sound like a downer, but it's, it's probably going to be the last one of 2017. There aren't that many days left this year, but maybe next year, as they do more and more Reddit challenges, I'll do some more. But all of that is besides the point, because on screen now we have some more videos. So top left is the Icarus SS2, like I mentioned earlier, which is to Elu and Leith. Top right is an unmonetized video, and it's uh, the music video version of this one, so I hope you enjoy that if you choose to watch it, I highly recommend it. Bottom left is my most recent upload, and bottom right was chosen for you by YouTube's bots, so enjoy. <laughs> 